Praise the Lord, Kaya. Praise the Lord, Kaya. How many of you came to give God praise on this evening? Let me see you wave your hand if you came to give God praise this evening. We ask that you stand on your feet and worship with us. As we lift up the name of Jesus. Say hi, pray. The Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. And his glory above all nations. And his glory above all nations. So give God the highest praise and bless his holy name. Let all God's people say, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Say, I pray. I pray. Say, I pray.
you serve a great and marvelous God. I'm so glad that when I'm in my darkest place, all I have to do is reach out my hand and the Lord will pull me out of that dark place. Aren't you glad you serve a marvelous God? Do I have a witness in here who's been in a dark place where you can't seem to find anyone around you? There's no one to help you. But when you reach out your hand and stretch out your hand to God and you pray to him, he will bring you out of that darkness. I'm so glad from escaping that dark place. I praise God this afternoon. Hallelujah. You're a great God. You brought me out, you brought me out from darkness into light. The power of Satan is broken. I'm free. I'll shout your praise.
of you know that we serve a great God. He's amazing.
God your own prayer. You would talk to the Lord. Paul, some of us have been so busy this day and we really haven't prayed. So can we pause for just a moment wherever you may be? Talk to God however you feel led by the Holy Spirit. Let's just have Father, our God, there are so many things that we bring before you tonight. So many confessions of failures and sin. But maybe the greatest, O oh Lord, is that we've tried to live life on our own without staying connected to you as we need to. We get so busy and move so much, and God, we've given more of ourselves to other things and other people than we have to our relationship with you. And yet we wonder why we struggle so much. Something or someone else has had our undivided attention. Something or someone else got us first thing in the morning. Something or someone else, God, got the very best that we have and we come to you with leftovers after we've given to so many other things. Lord, tonight I pray that somehow, way, your Holy Spirit would help reprioritize our lives that we would remember the words of our Savior who said you got to put God first and everything else will fall in its right place. We seek to put you back on the throne of our life to make you the highest priority of our day, to make pleasing you the very reason why we get out of the bed in the morning, that you might look at us and say, well done. God, we ask your forgiveness upon the areas of our lives where we struggle and sin, where we've fallen short of your will and your word. The very fact that I'm alive and in church tonight must mean that you're not finished with me yet. So Lord, I rebuke the spirit of guilt that's got somebody incarcerated tonight. I speak deliverance over someone who believes that they cannot change. And I say that if any man or woman be in Christ, they are new creatures, old things have passed away and all things shall become new. Make us new tonight, O oh Lord. As you give your name the glory and the praise for this opportunity we have to share in the study of your holy word. Lord, I thank you for my neighbor on my left and my right, may not even know them, but I'm grateful that you've spared their life through another day. And I receive them now as a vessel of the love of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and declare that we are blessed to worship together with one another. Sanctify this moment, secure our thoughts, guard us from all distractions, O oh God that we might hear what the Spirit says to the church on this night. In the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. I greet you all in the grace and in the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and thank God for another opportunity we have to gather together for our Wednesday worship as we come as we are, believing that the Lord won't leave us that way. I welcome back some very familiar faces who are here all the time. We also pause to recognize anyone who may be a blessing to us because it's your first time at a come as you are worship experience and we don't take that lightly we know that on wednesday night there's a whole lot of other things you could be doing as a matter of fact i was speaking with someone the other day and they were saying how grateful they were the kaya was on wednesday and not thursday night because i know if it was on thursday night <laughs> amen a whole lot of y'all be watching online <laughs> and so the fact that you're here on a wednesday night we praise god for you if this is your first kaya would you just wave a hand we want to welcome all of our first timers would you help me bless god if you've got a first timer next to you Welcome, welcome, welcome. It may be your first, but we pray it won't be your last. Listen, I want to read a word from the Lord that kind of lays the foundation for what the Lord is going to say to us today. It's our devotional reading. Um, the ushers uh, and Kaya leadership team is going to come to raise an offering. We believe in being mature givers. We don't beg. We don't use gimmicks. We don't give false promises. We say that if you're a mature Christian and you know that the Lord is blessing you in any way, that you ought to sow into that, that others may receive as well. So as you hear this word from the Lord, I also ask that you be in prayer to let the Spirit lead you as to what God will purpose within your heart to give. It is a familiar passage of Scripture to us. Um, we've dealt with it once before in Kaya, and tonight we'll look at it in a different light. But it's from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. 
you got your devices out, your smartphones, um, unless you get uh, the new six is probably bent. But if you would go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. There's sometimes we read scriptures that make us shout and feel good, the promises of God, the power of God it speaks of. But most of scripture is meant to align us with God's will, and those aren't always comfortable passages. So here, what for some of us may be an uncomfortable passage in God's holy word in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, why don't we go on and start and begin at verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the almighty Lord. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Speak to our hearts, God. Our Kaya praise team is going to bless us in song. Our Kaya leadership is going to come and raise an offering. We ask that you would give as the Lord has placed in your heart in preparation for what you believe God is going to speak and teach on tonight. And we welcome them as they come. And we get ready to hear a word from the Lord.
Lord, we're grateful for the opportunity to gather in sacred and safe space, transparent and authentic about who we are and who we are not. And yet believing that the power of your word, the blood of Jesus Christ, the convicting presence and comforting guidance of the Holy Spirit can shape us like clay in a potter's hands that we may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect. I thank you for every brother and sister in Christ gathered in this place and ask now, O oh God, that you would speak in a way that you convict our hearts and our minds that may leave this place saying, what must I do to fulfill God's will in my life? In the precious and perfect name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. I greet you all with grace and peace and thank God for what I believe is a powerful time for us to gather. The Lord has placed something kind of deep on my heart, and I'm going to try my best to walk through it expeditiously and have an opportunity. I don't know if we will, Mark, but maybe, depending on time, I have a few practical questions. I want to share some things that the Lord has placed on me from Scripture and from real life as a pastor, and if there's any way that we can break it down practically with those who may want to ask questions, we'll do so, or I can encourage you to send email questions to us through our website or an email address, and I'll be able to address your questions at a later date. Um, I want to talk to you tonight from the words of the Apostle Paul that we read in 2 Corinthians 6 about not being unequally yoked, um, that he challenges us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, but I would suggest to you as we teach tonight that you can be unequally yoked with believers as well. Uh, and how we have to be very discerning about who we yoke ourselves to and for what purpose. And I'll get into that in just a little bit. I want to begin by telling you a story that some of you may know from Scripture. It is uh, really part of the Genesis story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that leads to Joseph, which basically sets up the children of Israel being in bondage in the book of Exodus. So you know that basically the second half of Genesis follows the life of Joseph. Joseph's father was a brother by the name of Jacob. You all remember Jacob, he's the one who wrestles with the angel, and his name is changed from Jacob to, to Israel. Okay, we're going to read our Bibles. We're going to read our Bibles. <laughs> uh, his name is changed from Jacob to Israel. I want to tell you a little story that comes from uh, the 29th chapter, the 29th chapter of Genesis. You can read it when you get home about Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. Now, I want to say at the very beginning that whenever you see one brother with two sisters, this story probably ain't going to go well. <laughs> um, brothers, I just give you a word of advice from Scripture. One is enough. Uh, two and you got trouble. Uh, Jacob. Jacob is a trickster. He's a con man. And his past antics have caused family tension with his twin brother, whose name is Esau. We're Bible readers. Jacob and Esau. Esau is a warrior who is determined he's going to kill Jacob. In order to save Jacob, his mother Rebecca sends him to live with his uncle Laban. Jacob goes to live with Laban, and we know that Jacob encounters two of Laban's daughters. One whose name is Leah, and the other is Rachel. We don't know much about Leah and Rachel except something that comes in verse 17 of Genesis 29, where it says that Leah had pleasant eyes, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Leah has delicate eyes, but Rachel is beautiful in form and appearance. Now, I want you to pause there so you understand the story because to say that Leah has a delicate eye may make you feel that, oh, you know, she has beautiful eyes. That's not what the Hebrew literally means. It means she has a weak eye, which is nice way of saying Leah looks like this. Okay? One eye goes there, the other, and you don't know who she's talking to, you know? Uh, okay. 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 Leah has a weak eye. But what's even more telling is that the Bible says, but Rachel was beautiful. Okay, so Leah has a weak eye, but 
Rachel was beautiful. That but kind of lets you know something about Leah. That if Rachel is described as being beautiful, the but must suggest that Leah was not. Rachel was the fine one in form and appearance. <laughs> beautiful in form and appearance. And Jacob wants Rachel. According to the tradition and customs of that era, he had to serve Laban for a number of years in order to earn the right to marry Rachel. So you all know how the story goes. He worked seven years under Laban that he might earn the right to marry Rachel. Laban agrees, sets it up for the wedding. The nighttime comes and he sends his daughter in to Jacob. They consummate the marriage. And Jacob wakes up in the morning to find out it's not Rachel, it's Leah. There's a, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, how he was with her at night but didn't know he had the wrong one. But he wakes up and he's mad that Laban has given him Leah and not Rachel. And Laban says, basically, listen, Leah's the older one. She's got a weak eye. Uh, you know, I had to hook up with somebody. But if you want Rachel, if you work seven more years, you can have Rachel. Jacob works seven more years to get Rachel. So now he's worked 14 years in order to get a woman when after seven, he already had a wife. Okay. Now, you got to know something about Rachel and Leah. The Bible says, as you keep on reading, that Leah is very fertile and Rachel is barren. And Leah gives Jacob what every good Israelite man wants in that day, sons. Not just one, not just two, not just three. She births him four sons, and Rachel is barren. Now, here's a question that I ask. Why would Jacob work seven years more after he's already gotten Leah to get Rachel? Leah is a good woman, and Leah has given him what every good Israelite man wants, multiple sons. Rachel is barren and cannot give him what every man wants. And when Rachel and Leah are married to the same man, all hell breaks out between them. Sisters fighting one another. As a matter of fact, it gets so bad when you read how they name their children. Rachel names one of the children that was birthed to her maidservant that she could claim as her own. She names him Naphtali. You know what Naphtali means? I beat my sister. She names a child after her conflict with her sister. That's how bad things have gotten. All holy heck is breaking loose in this house. And the question is, why would Jacob work seven more years to get a woman who was barren at the expense of peace in this house when he had a wife who was good and gave him everything an Israelite man wants, and that's multiple sons. How in the world would he go for Rachel after he already had Leah? Because Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Leah gave him 80% of what he wanted. And Rachel, all Rachel could offer was beauty and form and appearance. But he was willing to work and lose peace in his home to add the extra 20 that made up for what Leah was missing. Jacob found himself in a place that it's very easy to find yourself. <laughs> Go back one slide, please. <laughs> he finds himself in a place where it's very easy to wind up with someone who is good, and brings you about 80% of what you need to be satisfied, committed, and happy in a relationship. And they're only missing 20%. You all know what we hear about all the time, called the 80-20 situation. Now you can put it up. 
the, uh, the 80 20 situation that people wind up in. We realize that the person you're with, engaged to, even married possibly, is good but is lacking in a certain area. Doesn't meet 100% of the needs you have. Isn't everything you prayed for and asked for, but has more than average, batting over 50. And yet there's still some things missing. And when you get in an 80-20 situation, where you're with someone who's fulfilling just about most of your needs, but not all of them, you're gonna find that you've got one of three options. One of three options typically play themselves out in our relationships. Number one is that you will abandon the 80 to go for the 20, hoping that the 20 has the other 80 as well. In other words, you'll leave the one you're with to pursue that other 20%, only to find out, like Jacob, you may be chasing beauty that is barren. That hits that need, but it cannot produce what it is you need. But you'll abandon what you had to chase for what you want. Some of us have been down that road where someone left us for someone else, and you couldn't for the life figure out what he or she had that you were missing. And the worst thing in the world you can do is ask someone who left you why, because they'll never give you the real answer. It's me, um, you know. I'm just wrestling with some stuff, you know. I'm. Thank <laughs> you.